This episode of the Kestrel Country Podcast is brought to you by Kestrel Realty Group and Kestrel Property Management. Let us be your guide. This is the Kestrel Country Podcast, where we discuss the people, places, and events all around Kestrel Country. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Kestrel Country Podcast. We really appreciate you all listening and uh, I'm your host, Mike Church, joined here once again by my lovely wife and co-host, Catherine. Hello, hello. And um, we are coming to you from Daylight Savings Time. Yes. The switch over happened. Hopefully everyone is doing okay, but it was brighter this evening, so... So Say what you will about daylight savings time. It extends <laughs> those evenings. <laughs> so this week uh, we have Dr. Christopher Schlecht who on both? the podcast, who is a historian. So we're kind of leapfrogging off of our, uh, what was it, our second episode? Third episode, th- fourth, know. somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. Our second interview. Yes. Which was with Dulcie from, from the Laytaw County Historical Society. Um, and so we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and actually go back. In time. Yeah. Go back in time a little bit further um, before Moscow was founded, before And really, we started out before um, white people ever even came out to this area. That's right. And so Dr. Schlecht, who we both had in college as a professor, was kind enough to join us and give us a history rundown on that. Yeah, so we talked a lot about the Nez Perce Indians, um, the um, White Bird Canyon, the the battle down there, Um, talked some about Chief Joseph. Um, yeah, it was really fascinating and his, his knowledge of, um, history, but particularly the Nez Perce, um, area really goes deep. Um, he is, has been a, um, a park ranger yep. down there yep. has worked for the national park service and, um, yeah, also is a, is a professor of history at new St. Andrews college. And what you have a little bit there on his background as yep, well. Yep, he had, he received his B, BA in history from WSU in 1990. He got his MA in history from the U of I in 2005, and his PhD in history from WSU in 2015. Nice. So he's got both sides of the border here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we really enjoy talking to him. Uh, we will definitely have him on again because he clearly knows so much, and we barely scratched the surface. But it was really fun to get a good overview of some of the history of the peoples that were here um, before any of us ever came and, um, and learned about some of the conflict, some of um, the kind of butting heads of the um, federal policies with the local peoples and really fascinating and, and, and fairly tragic as well. Yeah, that's true. But stuff you can still go see, you know, and we think of, of, you know, the ancient world and, there's, he points out in the podcast, so I won't spoil all of it, but that there's stuff you can see that's pretty old here. Really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And so kind of keeping with that, um, exploring the area, there's a lot of history here to explore, and um, we're excited to go see some more of this stuff and see it with a little bit of a, maybe a, a more knowledge and with our eyes opened a little bit more towards it. So without further ado, let's get into our interview with Dr. Schlecht. Dr. Schlecht, thank you for joining us today. Good morning. It is a delight to be here. Yeah. Well, we wanted to uh, have you on um, to talk about history, because you are a history professor. We actually I, both had him. Yeah, we, we did. That's right. That's like the good old days. And there will be a test at the end. <laughs> oh, no. We're, we re- stay we're recording this, thing. though. We're recording this, though, so we get an advantage. That's right. So, yeah, first of all, I guess, tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, 
who you are and what you're doing here in Moscow. I teach at New St. Andrews College. I'm senior fellow of history there, and I also oversee one of their graduate programs. I One of the history interests that I have among several is to study the story of the Nez Perce people and their interaction with the Soyapo. Um, that refers to the color of my skin and okay. yours. Okay. <laughs> we are white people. Uh, but the westward expansion, manifest destiny, uh, encounters these people have been living around in these parts as long as human memory traces back. And those encounters are fascinating uh, cultural collisions, the negotiations, the conflicts, the harmonies and arrangements that uh, are still very much with us today, I find fascinating. Yeah. So there, did you, are you from this area? Have you always been interested in that or has that been a more recent um, study for you? Yeah, probably in the last 15 years. I grew up, did most of my growing up in Western Washington, um, but I have been a history guy for some 25, 30 years. And about 10 years into a career of teaching, it occurred to me that I had to become acquainted with the history in my own area. Hmm. And so I felt rather chastised, actually. I'm a history guy, and I actually don't even know the history of this area. So uh, I wound up uh, pursuing it, and lo and behold, it actually related very closely to some research interests that I already had at that time, Presbyterian church history and church missions. And it was the Presbyterians who were uh, who had mission work with the Nez Perce people. Um, so I realized, hey, I'm studying Presbyterian and Presbyterian missions all this time, and here it is in my own backyard. And for a time, I was a park ranger um, for five or six years at the Nez Perce National Historical Park. So I actually got to lead tours. I continue guiding tours, school groups, and that sort of thing um, through Nez Perce territory. That's awesome. Well, one, one of the things that I think triggered our interest in having you on was we had um dulce lark from cursing lark from the latar county historical society on and we talked about kind of moscow's founding this some of the stuff right. that came after but it was like well what happened before what was there before yeah. what was this area like before the founding of these towns and basically the westward expansion and all of that and so um i guess yeah can you tell us a little bit about I know it's a broad subject, but the history of the the Nez Perce people in this area and what it was kind of like before all of that came about. Right. Yeah, Dulcie's great. We history people mm-hmm. stick together. I know Dulcie. Um, well, the Nez Perce people are fairly unique uh, in that they have been in this area since as long as human memory traces. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that from archaeological evidence. There's archaeological digs that have been conducted along the Clearwater and Snake Rivers and Salmon Rivers that point to human occupation that just goes way back. Um, We also look at their storytelling lore, and a lot of Native American groups have a rich storytelling lore. The Nez Perce are no different. One of the things that's peculiar about their storytelling lore is that there are no motifs that are migration motifs, like back when we crossed the great waters mm. or we came across the mountains. or And that's unusual. Um, coupled with the fact that a lot of their ancient, ancient stories are really geographically precise. You can go to a certain spot on the Snake River, and I love to do that to recap some of these stories. You can go to certain places where Coyote did this. Their creation story is based... Uh, on a site in Kamii called Heart of the Monster. And uh, a lot of lore is kind of like a long time ago in a, in a place far, far away. Yeah. Basically. And a lot of uh, folklore is kind of like that. It's not precisely situated. And with the Nez Perce, it is a long time ago, but the place is very specific. Mm-hmm. And that's unique. And it testifies to the antiquity of these people here. They have been here again since as far back as human memory traces i haven't even gotten to the story of white contact yet but part of it is to realize that when whites came out here um, they were 
already encountering something that's very ancient. In fact, I, on the tours that I lead, I point to petroglyphs on the Snake River that are as old as the Great Pyramid of Cheops. That's wow. crazy. Because <laughs> you think so, of this as being so young out here in Idaho, but not realizing that we have something that's lasted that that's long. That's just our history. That's, that's exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's just our, yeah, our memory. Yeah, man-made objects as old as the pyramids here. right here. Wow. Yep. And what, um, so you're, you lead the tours down there. Right. Um, what about up on the Palouse? I mean, were they, were, is there any reference going back that far to anything up here? Or were there? Yeah, so some of the some of the bands and affiliated bands um, are up here. Of course, uh, north of here we have the Coeur d'Alene's as well. Uh, but the Palouses were closely affiliated with the Nez Perce. And when I say closely affiliated, you know who are the Nez Perce? You can have, you know, the Picunans in Hell's Canyon, the Wallowas in northeastern Oregon, the Alpoas. Uh, at the confluence of the Snake and Clearwater Rivers. Um, those are mm. the their kind of group names. Mm. And then we come in and we call them all Nez Perce by clustering in our tidy minds these groups of people that are actually rather fluid. Mm. And the Palouses would certainly be in that mix. Interesting. So um, what what does that tour look like, I guess? what What are some of the sites you see or the stories? What... Um, so we've kind of talked about the ancientness of them, right? Right. But then is yeah, most of so the tour kind of around stuff that once white contact came in and yes, most, most of the stories that I tell, and of course that the ancient stuff contextualizes it, but the story of white contact and, and, uh, the story of white contact uh, begins with Lewis, Lewis and Clark, the core of the discovery came through here and the interactions with the Nespers were very important to them. Then we have the fur traders uh, who came through, and then the missionaries. And I spent a lot of time talking about the missionaries uh, who came in the 1830s. And uh, beyond that, we have uh, the establishment of this place as part of the United States. This became part of the United States in 1846. And then the infrastructure and apparatus of the U.S. comes in, and that's going to lead to conflict in a war of 1877. And I tell the story of that war, too, and uh, plenty of interactions since that time. Can you give us the... the Whitebird? <laughs> yeah. I was thinking Whitebird. Whitebird, which... <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, there's, there's so many stories to tell, and I've just given the low fly over here. Uh-huh. But you want to tell me, talk about the Battle of Whitebird Canyon? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, can you... I know it's, it's hard to condense, but to... Um, Especially to, for me. There's just so much to talk about. <laughs> I know. It's like fly it's, over at 30,000 feet good. and dive down. In the <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's painful, yes. Yes, the Whitebird Canyon is, I would say, the, the site of the most significant battle in the Pacific Northwest, which occurred in June of 1877. And that was marked the outbreak of the Nez Perce War, um, the U.S. government's uh, conflict with the Nez Perce. Um, and so at that battle, we have uh, basically the U.S. cavalry marching down from Fort Lapway uh, to intervene in some skirmishes between Native Americans and locals that were there. Um, and the backstory to those skirmishes is a rich story in and of itself. But nonetheless, we have uh, cavalry going down there and ultimately intercepting the Nez Perce at, in Whitebird Canyon. And uh, it was a rout uh, in favor of the Nez Perce. Nez Perce suffered no casualties hmm. and about 33 men, one third of the cavalry died. Wow. Uh, and that, that's significant just for the battle itself and the human tragedy that it represents, but it also is the conflict then that says, okay, now we are at war. We are at war um, between the United States and the Nez Perce people. And uh, so that precipitates what's going to be throughout the summer of 1877, this defensive march that where the Nez Perce are just trying to get away from the U.S. cavalry and ultimately wind up surrendering um, at uh, Bear Paw, just 40 miles south of the Canadian border. Okay. So before that time, so 1830s to 1877, right. um, had there been really very little conflict between the Nez Perce and, 
and the whites or was there intermittent and just I guess what what led to that conflict what what led to that conflict yes it was uh, the the cleanest way to describe it is to talk about the treaties that precipitated it that, that preceded it um, and there were two treaties with the Nez Perce the first one in 1855 um, and uh, Governor Isaac Stevens, who was the Washington territorial governor at the time, negotiated the treaty with the Nez Perce and had a lot of boilerplate provisions uh, that we see. I think uh, Stevens negotiated uh, 11 or 12 treaties, something like that, you know, treaties with the Yakima, treaties with the Nez Perce, with the, uh, anyway, a host of Native American groups. Um, and the Nez Perce, uh, had the largest territory, seven and a half million acres, that includes the entire drainage of the Clearwater River, um, the uh, lower Snake River through Hell's Canyon, uh, the Wallowa Territory of North, Northeastern Oregon. And then, just five years after that treaty was negotiated uh, and signed, um, up at Pierce, gold was discovered. Mm. <clears throat> and that led to a gold rush uh, by 1862, by 1862, there were probably about 13,000 whites where they shouldn't be um, on, in Nez Perce territory. Uh, and so in response to that, the United States government, um, it's important to contextualize here, is fighting the Civil War at this point back east. Right. <laughs> the Civil War has broken out. Uh, they have bigger fish to fry, and they just don't want problems here. So uh, they adopt a policy to shrink the size of the reservation to 10% of its 1855 size. Wow. Um, and so that leads to the Treaty of 1863. Uh, some Nez Perce uh, agree to it. Uh, there was probably some, well, let's not call this an even negotiation, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but some, those who agreed to it, uh, um, not sort of equal parties coming to the table, but then another Nez Perce said, well, forget it. We, we're not interested in this. And, uh, and so by the time we get to 1877, what it is is an effort on the United States government to sort of corral the non-treaty Nez Perce onto the smaller reservation. And who was Chief Joseph? What was his role in that? Because you mentioned that there were all these different people, right. right? And that the U.S. government or this just kind of wanted to lump them all into one. Right, exactly. The, in fact, the, the term chief, I prefer to use the term headman. Um, and the reason why I say that is because uh, the term chief, it's a, it's a nice term that we have. And we, and we like clean and tidy organizational flowcharts. Uh, with, you know, scope of work and responsibility and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and the U.S. government's idea, it's, and it's very much an Anglo-European notion of social order, is if you get one person's signature on a treaty, then you have bound an entire community of mm -hmm. people to certain limitations mm -hmm. and behaviors. That idea of representation, which is a very Anglo-European notion of representation, right? And we all understand that. If you know, whether we like our president or hate our president, he's our president, and those are U.S. policies. We all, we all kind of understand that. That's not the way Native American groups understood themselves with one another. Anyway, so who was Chief Joseph? I'm <laughs> going around the book. There were, uh, there were his, his father, um, Chief Joseph, uh, the elder and the younger. Chief Joseph, the elder, was one of the fellows who did refused to sign that treaty of 1863 mm. and uh, he raised his son to never sell the land upon which your father's bones rest um, and so he died and his son chief joseph in the wallawa territory um, emerges as kind of the the uh I would say the political leader. Um, his brother Olicott was, I would say, the military genius behind them. Um, but it was Joseph and Olicott who the U.S. government was dealing with during that uh, conflict of 1877. Mm. And they were there at Whitebird, and then yes. all the way through the march up to that's exactly towards the Canadian border. That's exactly right. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, so they were they were kind of the front head men of the Nez Perce group. Mm -hmm. um, but it represented kind of an affiliation, a, a collection of of several non-treaty groups. Uh, you have Tahul Huzit, who was in Hills Canyon. He was at Pecunin. You have Joseph and Alakot. They were Wallawas, um, and there were others represented as well. And and how long you said it was a matter? Was it a matter of months or years? Yes, ultimate months. Um, so Whitebird Canyon was June seventeenth, eighteen seventy seven, and the surrender at Bear Paw was in uh, early October, and the snow had just started to fall. Mm -hmm. um, the Nez Perce were beset with, well, they, they were basically attacked. Uh, a handful of them actually did cross the Canadian border um, oh. at the time uh, under under the leadership of White Bird, after whom the canyon is named. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but famously, Chief Joseph uh, mm -hmm. delivers that famous speech, I will fight no more forever. Um, you know, my, my, our children are hungry and dying. Our old, old people are dying. We have no blankets and that sort of thing. And so that's one of the famous speeches of the American West, his surrender at Bear Paw. Yeah. So, but that was October. So June to October, 1877. Okay. Yeah. An important part of the backdrop to that was that the previous engagement um, between, but out here in the American West was 1876. And um, in Montana, that was a battle of Little Bighorn mm -hmm. when George Armstrong, Custer basically got routed. Hundreds and hundreds of men were killed by sitting bull, crazy horse, that whole crew. Um, and back at the, in the war office, General William Tecumseh Sherman was in charge at that time. Um, and, and if you think about this in context, you have the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, and then the very next conflict by the United States Army is White Bird Canyon. And General Sherman was not about to let the U.S. Army be embarrassed. And so kind of the ruthless drive mm. Uh, on the part of the United States against the Nez Perce, if you think of General Sherman, this guy who marched to the sea mm -hmm. through the South, that sort of thing, is the one who's kind of barking down orders. Um, and uh, that helps to explain kind of this fixation the United States government had upon dealing with these Nez Perce who had embarrassed them at White Bird Canyon. Mm -hmm. It's a real tragedy. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Where, um, so... There's tours, there's, uh, what are some of the sites that you would encourage people to go visit and what are, you know, so you said kind of you lived here for a while before you That's really right. dove into mm -hmm. it. What are some things that, that um, we should, kind of listeners should uh, go visit. see and um, what are ways to learn about, well, about that? Well, uh, White Bird Canyon, of course, is, uh, is very important. And if you can get someone to guide you someone from the Nez Perce National Historical Park, hop onto one of my tours. It really helps you to understand the flow of the battle. There's an interpretive kiosk by Highway 95 that's up above it there. Um, and I think it's really hard to make out what actually happened in the battle from, from there. It really does take a guide. So Whitebird Canyon would be, would be very important. Um, the Spalding site, that's the headquarters site of the Nez Perce National Historical Park, uh, which is about 10 miles east of Lewiston along Highway 95. Um, that's the site of Henry Spaulding's mission, uh, the historic site of the mission, and that's an important place to visit. Then uh, there are places along the, the Clearwater River that are important. Um, I was over at Kamei, the heart of the monster, uh, some of the stories that I was telling. If you know where to stop, sometimes you need guides to so, know some of the other spots, but heart of the monster is pretty well interpreted. Um, out at Kamei. And is that, so the Spalding mission, is that where you would find, is that where you'd find the guide and yes. get set up with kind of that, all yes. that information? Yes, and if you, yeah, uh, reach out to the Nez Perce National Historical Park, and that's where the visitor center is there. Um, if you can make your way over to Montana, um, Big Hole National Battlefield, which I would say, while the White Bird Canyon is in our region, the most important battle and battle site of that whole conflict would be Big Hole, mm. which is a beautiful drive. You drive through the Lolo Trail to get there. Just the journey to get there is really well worth your while. Where and where is, so 
Where's that's, Big Hole in Montana? That's by Wisdom, Montana. So if you go from where we are here on the Palouse, you follow Highway 12 almost to Missoula, but you turn south um, right after you cross the Lolo Pass there. You turn south, and, um, and you can Google it. Big, big hole national battlefield, um, but it's got its own visitor center and interpretive films and such. That was, and that really uh, helps you to appreciate the tragedy of mm. the the War of eighteen seventy seven. So is that the, the where they is that the trail of the the war? So it started yes, exactly. started at Whitebird and went up basically. Yes, low low. Exactly the Nez the Nez Perce. Uh, if you if you look at this and you can see a map of their journey until it comes to just south of uh, the the Canadian border, um, and it looks like they took kind of a meandering route, but they believed that they were just simply dealing personally with General Oliver Otis Howard, who was out here, and he was the general on the scene um, who they were dealing with, and and uh, it was his troops. They were working under his orders uh, at Battle of Whitebird Canyon, and they knew that General Howard's jurisdiction was it extended to the Continental Divide. Oh. Um, and so they thought, we're just dealing with General Howard, and so we get away from him and we're fine. And then, uh, what, and it was hard for them to understand that when you, comes back to what I was saying about chief, when you're, when you're dealing with someone, representation, and there's a whole apparatus that extends to the East Coast that they're dealing with, mm. yeah. you know, not just... And so the plan, plan A was to get away from General Howard, and then they're attacked at Big Hole, and they realize, oh, we're not done, um, and they're able to sort of counterattack and escape uh, being caught at Big Hole. And then they move through, and they thought, well, we'll deal with, we'll interact with the crow, you know, we... We've hunted with them, and we'll just sort of get protection from them. And this is when they actually go through Yellowstone National Park. Um, and the crow said, basically, yeah, we sympathize with you, but we don't want you, um, we don't want the government come, mm. coming after us too. And so plan C is to head up to Canada where Sitting Bull was um, in the wake of 1876. Um and Custer's last stand, the Battle of Little Bighorn. You know, after that, Sitting Bull had gone up to Canada, and so that was where the Nez Perce were heading. So, if you mm -hmm. think about, they they kind of their objective shifts, mm -hmm. um, and that explains the meandering route that they take. Yeah, interesting. Do you have any recommendations on books? Your top picks for the you know more about it? Yeah, if you want to uh, let's see Alvin Josephi's book. Uh, Nez Perce and the opening of the Northwest um, gives uh, that's pretty that's a pretty big fat book you know some six or seven hundred pages it's excellent and I think I would say one of the best the best book my there are many books that have been written, written on the war my favorite go-to book is by Elliot West it's called the last Indian war um, and so those are the the go-to books that I would I would go to and then um, there's a condensation of Josephi's book that's about 120 pages that I recommend most highly because most people don't have the stamina for the 600-page <laughs> version. And uh, Joseph, and I'm trying to remember, it's something like Nez Perce Country um, or something like that, and it's a condensation of his 600-page book, and it's a, it's a really well-done condensation so if you just want the 120 page version which i think many people probably do mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's sure. the one to go for <laughs> awesome well thank you so much for for coming on um we'll wrap that up there for now i'm sure we'll want to have some more discussions later oh no, there's so, so much to talk so about much. <laughs> so much to talk but, about yeah i really appreciate your time and thank um, you so thank much you. i'm always happy to talk about history